Is this thing working? Outstanding. All right. So, like I said, we'll wait. It's 11:32. Uh, we'll give them a couple more minutes. See if anybody shows up, and we'll get this thing started. But for those of you here, thanks for coming, because I know most of us are hungover and tired, and you know. So, I do appreciate it. We were, yeah, it was about, what, 345 when they finally, like, you got to go. Yeah, and uh, and then I ran into some guys down the hallway, and they were like, you want to go to Waffle House? And I'm like, I absolutely want to go to Waffle House. <laughs> yeah. And so we got back from Waffle House at like 530. Yeah. Needless to say, when I went into the room, the wife was not happy. But. Garrett, hey man, thanks for coming, dude. For the record, I really appreciate all you showing up because seriously, I have literally given talks on you know Southeast Linux Fest Sunday afternoons to empty rooms. So uh, because obviously they record it and they stream it, so you you have to give the talk whether anybody shows up in the room or not. So <laughs> and it's checkout time and it's Father's Day, and uh, oh thank you, thank you. So. Happy Father's Day to those of you who are fathers. And, uh, yep. Yep. Which one? I'm sorry. Dude, I was. It's Highway 25W is what it is, but I don't know what they call it locally. Like, it's probably like La Follette Freeway or something, but, you know, but, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it's Highway 25W until it gets to downtown La Follette, and then it breaks off, and 25W kind of cuts up through the middle of the mountains. And then uh, if you go straight, you end up being on Highway 61, which runs all the way up to Powell Valley into the Cumberland Gap in Virginia. So, yes. So... Hopefully, my mic will not die. <coughs> All right. So, let's get this started. 11.35. So, thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you who know me, I am Mark White. But if you want to find me online, you'll find me under my gnome de plume of Linux Old Beardley. That is where my blog is, my Twitter handle, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I do a little bit of blogging, a little bit of consulting. So, there's some, definitely some information out there if you're interested in it. So, uh, I've been involved with open source for about 22 years now. Uh, I started with Debian in the late 90s. I worked with uh, a number of Debian package maintainers doing package testing for those guys for about a decade. Uh, I left the Debian project a few years back, currently working with the Dev1 project, which is basically Debian without system D. So, if you're looking for a solid Linux platform, uh, for your servers, uh, feel free to check out Dev1. I am running it in production in two different startups, so it is very, very stable and easy to use. So, running with giants, how to sell open source to your organization, or pretty much any other idea. So, uh, as tech people, uh, we tend to be a little, uh, a little autistic in our delivery, and I say that in an endearing way because I actually do have ASD something I've struggled with my entire life. And uh, I've, I've learned to embrace it, you know, in later years, uh, specifically in my early 30s, got some help with that. And uh, so now I'm trying to help other people deal with how we deliver our message to people who are non-technical folks. Uh, 
So running with giants, what does it mean? Uh, it means that as open source advocates, we have to compete with very large companies, people who have a whole lot of resources. Um, you know, up until recently, Microsoft was a fairly anti-open source company. Uh, and they were seen, you know, as Big Blue, the devil, whatever you wanted to call them. Uh, uh, however, uh, as of recent with their, uh, with their uh, acquisition of GitHub and their uh, push of the, you know, Linux subsystem on Windows, they're actually starting to embrace it a bit. But they're still a massive corporation which does not like open source competition. They work hard every day to push us out of the picture. Same things happen with IBM now that they've acquired Red Hat. Red Hat's going to be working really hard to make sure that the open source folks aren't nearly as successful as we used to be because IBM is not an open source company. They're all about profit. So now our bar for competition has raised quite a bit uh, over the last few years being the, uh, the push of open source within those two companies, Microsoft and IBM. So can we do this? Can we compete with those guys? We can, but it's not going to be hard. I mean, it's going to be very hard. It's not going to be easy. And uh, this is some uh, tried and true methods of, you know, sales engineering and sales methodology that, that's going to help us get that done. Uh, the talk may sound a little bit like a, a self-help uh, book, but, you know, that's kind of what it is for folks like me who struggle with interpersonal reactions when we're trying to talk to people who don't speak our language. So open source, it's hard work, very hard work. I don't know how many of you work on open source projects, but I work on a couple. And the truth is, I don't give as much time to those open source projects as I probably should. However, you know, as all of us do, I have responsibilities. You know, I have a family, I have a couple dogs, I have a job, I have a, I have a disabled father I take care of. So I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of responsibilities. So I can't always dedicate the amount of time that I really need to to my open source projects. And I assume most of us don't uh, because it's hard work and it's going to be harder in the future with, you know, corporate entities such as IBM and Microsoft pushing into the open source space. Uh, and, and you know what? No one cares that it's hard. No one cares that we have these pet projects that we care about. Uh, Dev1, Dev1 is very dear to me. Uh, I've been working on it for, I guess, about three years now. And I have a lot of reasons why I do not like uh, the system, the ecosystem. Uh, and I'm even starting to feel that way quite a bit about uh, the GNOME ecosystem within Linux. And uh, Dev1 excludes both of those. Uh, it's a very open source, purist distribution. And so, but that's my passion. And nobody cares about passions. Nobody cares about your pets. Your pets are not their pets. So we need to remember that nobody cares that, oh, I hate System D, but do you think a CEO at company ABC LLC cares? No, they don't care. They don't care if I hate System D. They want to know, can I provide them a solution that's going to save them time and money and make them more profitable? That's all they care about. So when we're, you know, kind of constructing our message to people who aren't in the technical community, we need to remember that. They don't care about our projects. Uh, very, very intelligent man I know. Uh, goes by the handle Catalaz online. He's actually was a senior developer in the Dev1 project, uh, and he's a PhD in computer science. Very, very smart man. Probably one of the smartest human beings I've ever met in my life. Actually said in a, in a meeting that he and I was having once that engineers are not interested in crusades. And the truth is, neither sea level people. Nobody cares about your crusade. Nobody cares that you're changing the world. All they want to know is, can you make their job easier? Can you save them money? Can you make them more profitable? So what we have to do is we have to look at open source as a brand. And it's a massive umbrella. So unfortunately, all open source projects get lumped together. So you know whether you're a Red Hat person, or a Fedora person, or a CentOS person, or a Dev1 person, or you, know, you work on some other open source things like Nmap, or you know, GitLab, or you're working on you know, any of those types of things, GitT, or you know, you're doing your own open source project. Unfortunately, we all get lumped in together. We're open source. We're not supported. We don't have corporate entities behind us. And unfortunately, we're all linked, whether we like it or not. So we live and die as a community. So all this starts and ends with us. 
You know, nobody's going to do this for us. And this entire talk is about how to enable ourselves to make open source successful in the commercial world. And not even just in the commercial world, maybe just in your own company. Maybe you work at a company, you're a, you're, you know, you're, you're a rail shop, and you want to say, hey, I want a more open source oriented Linux here. And you need to make a push to that. Maybe you want to move to CentOS. Maybe you want to move to you know, Debian. Maybe you want to move to Gentoo or Slackware. You know, any of those really, truly open source um, Linuxes that are out there. And uh, this is hopefully going to help you get that done. So, it starts with you. So I came up with these five tenets, and I actually didn't come up with these. I'm going to be honest, most of this came from Splunk. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with Splunk if you work in the technical world. Great company. I worked there for a while as a sales engineer. And uh, the one thing that Splunk did really well is that they trained their salespeople extraordinarily well. And uh, as a sales engineer, I got to go through all their professional services engineering training as well as their account manager training. Um, and it is, it, it was very good training. And so they, they kind of teach you how to do this from scratch. So after going through those things, th these are some of the tenets that I came up with that helps you be a better salesperson helps you advocate for your project, whatever it is, whatever you're trying to implement across your organization, or even to a third party organization if you're running, say, a consulting company. So, advocacy, deliverability, the concept of being a trusted advisor, how we shape our message to the people we talk to, and the hunter killer mentality. And that last one is really, it sells lingo, and, and we'll get pretty deep into that later. So, uh, first, advocacy. So what is it? What does it do for us? Uh, how does it apply to us? So networking and biz dev. So as an advocate, what are we doing to get our open source projects out there? Okay? I'm going to say, number one, right off, I am guilty of not doing enough advocacy and uh, business development for my open source projects. You know, as someone who works on a Linux distro, I need to be calling cloud providers. I need to be calling... DigitalOcean and hitting up the, the guys from Linode and Rackspace and Softlayer and Amazon and making sure that I have images of, you know, my, my open source distribution in their clouds because I haven't done that. And you know what? I'm, I'm failing, so I need to work better. So I'm really talking to myself as much as I'm talking to anyone out there. So uh, networking and biz dev, this is very important. So as open source advocates, we need to get out there. We need to advocate for our brands. We need to be doing business development, making sure that our project, whatever it is, is getting into the places it needs to be to get recognized, to be successful. And we have to take it seriously. Unfortunately, open source, it's kind of a job. Uh, and, and I know we come here, and the Southeast Linux Fest is one of the great parts of the open source community because we come here, we go to all these great talks, and we have a massive number of phenomenal talks at this, at this conference every year. We have a lot of fun. We have a great community. Uh, the camaraderie here is unmatched. But when we leave here, it's time to go back to work. It's time to get out there, be serious, start hitting up business executives, touching base, making phone calls, sending emails, talking to engineers, making sure that we're getting whatever project we're working on in front of the people that can make a difference to build our footprint. Uh, we, as individuals, represent our brand. So, you know, for Dev1, I'm, I represent their brand. If I screw up in the technical world, if I see something on Twitter that offends a bunch of people, well, guess what? I've hurt Dev1. So you got to remember that as an individual, for whatever project you work on, you're representing that brand. And, and it's an unfortunate truth. And, it, and honestly, it kind of sucks. It shouldn't be that way, but that's, the, that's just how the world works. And so when you're out there doing things, when you're out there representing yourself, you're also representing whatever open source project you're working for. You do represent that brand. And yes, open source as a whole is a brand. And whatever individual project you're working on is also a brand. So whatever you do reflects back on not only your individual project, but it's going to reflect back on the open source community as a whole. Uh, and we've seen some really good examples of how not to be from a lot of open source leadership uh, without mentioning any names, unless your name's Linus or Leonard. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so we know how not to act. So... Now we have to work on how do we act, and, and that's, that's very important. So remember, open source, whether it's the open source community as a whole or your individual open source project, it is a brand. So deliverability, what does this mean? 
So as, as nerds, we think of deliverability and we start thinking about continuous delivery, right? Continuous integration. Well, that's not what this is about. This is sales delivery. This is personal delivery. And the question is, as an individual, do you deliver? Are you delivering on your open source project? Are you putting the time in to make sure your open source project is successful? I'm going to tell you right now, I do not do this. I fail at this every single day. I want to put more time into open source, but like I said, we all have responsibilities outside of our projects, and I'm not very good at balancing these things, and I'm working on getting better. Uh, and, and once again, I ask, if not, what's stopping you? You know, for me, it's just personal responsibilities. I have a family. I have a job. I have a disabled father. Those things all pull me away from my open source work, and I really do want to more, do more open source work, so I have to do a better job of finding a work, life, open source balance so that I can do all the things that I need to do in life. Do you sell yourself as a brand? You know, uh, are you out there representing yourself and making others realize that you actually have something to offer? And what that's going to do, if you're doing this properly, it's going to create this role called the trusted advisor. And we're actually going to talk that about that a little bit more in just a minute. And are you developing your contacts? This goes back to the previous slide when we were talking about networking and biz dev. Are you out there talking to people who can make a difference for your project? Or, you know, I work on a Linux distro. What am I doing to call up cloud providers and saying, hey, can I get an image of my distro in your cloud uh, for general use, you know, as one of the default options? I should be doing that, and I haven't, so I'm failing. But <laughs> I can do better. <laughs> so the next is a trusted advisor. So in, in sales methodology, there's a book that came out called uh, the Challenger Method, and it talks about the uh, different types of salespeople and the ones that are most successful. And the single most successful type of salesperson continuously is the one called the Trusted Advisor. And that's who you want to become to be successful in selling your idea, your project, your open source initiative to anyone, whether it's your own company, a third-party company as a consultant, a government agency, whatever those things are, you have to become the Trusted Advisor. And just what that means is, is you've got to be a, a, an SME, a subject matter expert, and usually in more than one vertical. You want to be the guy that when, or the gal, that when someone has a question, they're going to call you up and say, hey, hey, Mark, I've got a question about such and such. I know you're not a network engineer, but we're getting ready to buy new switches. Do you have an opinion on this? And as a trusted advisor, even if you're not an expert on that, you need to have an educated opinion on things that are peripheral to your primary project. So you need to be the guy or the girl that's out there that's saying, hey, I can answer your questions. You want people to see you as a source of knowledge and information. That way, when you go to them and say, hey, I'd really like, to, I'd, I'd really like for you to give my open source project a chance, they're actually going to listen to you. you know. And this is, this is a very important thing. And this just isn't good for <coughs> selling and open source. This is for really anything in your life. You know, even personal relationships. You know, this is something that, you know, I could really do a better job of, e even in my own marriage, you know, is I, I have to be that trusted advisor for my spouse. I have to know, I want her to know that she can believe in me and trust in me. And if she comes to me with a question, I'm going to have an educated answer or I want to work really hard to get her a good answer. You know, you've got to build that trust with everyone around you. And last but not least, how do you communicate this? And uh, a lot of that goes into shaping your message, uh, especially when you're selling an open source project. As technology professionals, once again, we tend to be very, uh, very dry in our delivery. You know, as someone who has ASD and has struggled with interpersonal relationships for my entire life, I uh, always had a hard time, even when I had the better idea, of getting people to understand that my idea was actually better. Because here I am, I see a problem. I see a solution, and I can't get them to see what I see. So you've got to work on shaping your message. And how do you shape your message? Well, first and foremost, you've got to be aware of your delivery. You know, as someone who has ASD, I struggle with autism, I'm very dry. I say, this is how it is, A, B, and C. And there's no emotional inflection in what I do. It's just, this is just knowledge. This is just fact. And when people don't see it, because normal human beings have emotional responses, uh, it, it's very frustrating for people like me. 
And honestly, for most people in the technical community, even those of you that are on the spectrum, uh, it's, it's very hard because we see everything as engineers. We see, we see a problem, we see a solution, and it's like, why can't you see the solution? What's wrong with you? Are you stupid? This is so easy. Like, my 13-month-old son can do this. Why can't you do this? You know, and it's like, it's so frustrating. And you're like, why can't these people see what's going on? But you know what? You can't act like that. You can't be a brilliant jerk. Your tone matters, you know? Uh, and, and, and this is very important. You can't go out there and yell and scream and kick and fight, and you know, because that's, I'm a Marine. I'm a Marine with autism. That is literally my first response to everything. Oh, it's not going to work the way I want it? I'm going to break it. I'm going to break it till it works the way I want it. You don't want to listen to me? I'm going to force you to listen to me. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just my nature, you know, and, and I have to fight really hard, really hard to uh, kind of counterbalance that when I'm talking to people in professional environments. You know, I have to find a way to deliver and shape my message in a way that they're going to understand what my message actually is and adopt whatever I'm trying to convince them to adopt, whether it's a product, whether it's a policy. I do a lot of DevOps consulting. This is very important in consulting. You know, when I go out and I tell a company, hey, your entire company is broke. Your methodologies, your policies, everything you're, you're doing is making you less efficient right now. I can help you be more efficient. I can help you build a better product. But if I don't deliver that message right with the right tone in the right way, nobody's going to listen to me. They're going to be like, that dude is a giant a-hole. He is a jerk. And even if I'm right, even if I'm very smart, it does not matter. They're never going to implement the things that I try to communicate to them. So, the hunter killer mentality. This is actually lay, way less violent than it sounds, but it's the concept of going out there and getting what you need to be successful. So, if you're like myself, if you're a guy who's working on an open source Linux distribution, what are you doing to make that successful? Are you out there hunting for opportunities where you can get your platform in front of the most people? Am I calling cloud providers? Am I saying, hey, what do I have to do to get a version of my distro on a permanent image for general release at your company, you know? And then not only do you have to go out there and hunt those, you have to kill those opportunities. You have to make sure that you deliver. You have to be goal-oriented. You have to be like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to contact a dozen cloud providers, and I want at least two of them to adopt, it, to adopt using my image as a standard image for their company. And then you just got to work until you're successful. And this is where the hard work comes in. This is not easy. I was a sales engineer at Splunk. Our sales cycles were about nine months long. Do you know how hard it is to stay on one opportunity for nine straight months? It's miserable. But at the end of it, we were pretty successful. We, did, we had a few government agencies that after nine months, we were doing nine-figure deals with those guys. So, but we had to stay on it, nine months. And it's the same thing for open source. You got to focus you got to stay goal-oriented, and then you got to close. you got to kill it. It's so easy in life to get distracted. I am the world's worst of this. Uh, I was actually kind of working on an open source project called my in the, the Open Insulin Project. And the truth is, I dropped the ball on it. I dropped the ball on it because I owed them some stuff, and I didn't get it to them in time. And it's just because job got away, kid got in the way. You know, the wife needed me. And I had to live up to my responsibilities, and I didn't do a good job of balancing this, and I didn't close the opportunity. So if my personal brand suffered because I dropped the ball on this. So we're not perfect. We all screw up. We all make mistakes. It happens. The only thing you can do is turn around, remedy it the best you can, and move on. But always, always be focused on your goal and closing that goal. In sales, they talk about the concept of ABC, always be closing. Always be closing. What do you got to do to close this deal? What do you got to do to achieve your goal? So don't lose sight of that. So now, are you ready to run? Are we ready to run with these giants? Are we ready to compete with the IBM slash Red Hats of the world? Are we ready to compete with the Microsofts of the world? And even some of our own open source brothers and sisters who are corporations. You know, if you're, a, if you're a truly open source Linux distro, 
you're going to end up competing with SUSE and Ubuntu. And they've got big corporations behind them. So those, those, are, those are big obstacles to overcome. The competitors aren't slowing down. Microsoft's not going to take the next six months off. IBM's not going to send their entire company to Aruba so that you can catch up. You know, if, if you want your, your open source initiative, your idea, your project, your consulting company, whatever you're working on, if you want it to be successful, you have to work at it every single day. They hate us, mostly, you know. Uh, Microsoft has done a really good job of embracing the open source community later, th lately. However, they're not doing that out of altruism. Who thinks, you know, Bill Gates is out there saying, you know what, let me go talk to Steve Ballmer or whoever the current CEO of uh, uh, Microsoft is. I don't really follow Microsoft because I'm not really a big fan of those guys. But, uh, you know, let me go talk to the, you know, CEO and let's start a, let's start a uh, nonprofit section of Microsoft that's just going to do open source. That's not going to happen. Those guys, they have shareholders, they have stockholders, they're there to make money. So you know what? If we're a competitor and we're giving our wares away for free, oh, guess what? I run an open source Linux distro. It's faster, more stable, and easier to use than Windows Server, and I'll give it to you for free. Microsoft's not going to like that. IBM Red Hat's not going to like that. Canonical's not going to like that. So we're competing against all these guys as open source advocates. And you know what? They, they do mostly hate us because they do not want that open source competition. So we have to work that much harder. Um, and, and I've actually had a lot of interactions with some of these guys, uh, guys at Red Hat, you know, especially, you know, specific teams like the System D team. Those guys, they're, they're not nice people, you know, and they don't like us. So, <laughs> you know, we have, to, we have to work really hard to overcome the fact that they have all these resources behind them. They have loads of money to work with. They have thousands of paid employees to do what we're trying to do in our two hours of spare time every day. So it's very hard for us, but we can't lose sight. It's easy to get off track, forget what your goal is. It's even easier to inject your own bias. Once again, you have to remember, even though they're our pet projects, they're not their pet projects. You know, people don't care about our crusades, our passions. Once again, it comes back. Can you make my life easier? Can you save me money? Can you make me more profitable? That's what it all comes down to. So don't lose sight and don't inject your own bias. Don't use your passion for, you know, uh, you know, a persuasive argument for trying to get someone to adopt your open source platform. Exactly. Yep. So the statement was that, you know, when you're trying to explain to someone who, you know, is a potential user of open source, and you're saying, you know, the first thing we say as open ad source advocates is, hey, this is open source. This is freedom. This is, this is good for you. But to the, you know, common person, that's actually a negative thing. <laughs> so, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And that's what happens. So we have to remember... Our biases, they're not their biases. You know, we, we're, you know, we don't need to get into that, uh, you know, that, that type of mindset because if we do, we are going to fail. We are going to fail. I mean, it's great to have passion. It's great to use that passion to drive you. You just can't, you know, inject that passion into conversations, especially sales conversations. So, and in closing, nothing is guaranteed, okay? So as an as a open source advocate, as an open source salesperson, you can do everything right and still fail. You can do everything you should have done and still fail. You can go out there, you can talk to the companies, you can so consult for the companies, you can work with them for six months, you can convince them to give your software a try. They, mo they may love your software, but at the end of the day, you might do everything right and you can still fail. So don't take it personally. Don't take it personally. You just got to get back up on that horse and keep riding. The other thing is work hard, play hard, live life. Once again, it goes back to balance. I've not found a good balance for my open source projects versus my job versus my family. And it's something I work on every day to try to get better at. So you have to work hard, you have to play hard, you have to live your life. 
and don't burn out, okay? It's a real problem. It's happening a lot in Silicon Valley. There, has been a, there have been a rash of suicides over the last five years in Silicon Valley by technical professionals, people I knew, people I did conferences with, people I've done classes with, who are committing suicide because they're burning out at work and they feel overwhelmed by all the responsibility they have because they take on too much and they can't handle it. You know, they take on a project leader position, an open source project, they're trying to work a 40 hour a week job, they got a, you know, a spouse and kid at home and they just can't manage it all. It's too much and it causes burnout and burnout's a real problem. And there was actually an excellent talk here at this conference this year about work burnout. Uh, feel free to go watch that online because it was a really good talk and it's very important that we don't let that happen to us. So, I, uh, it's only 12.03, but uh, that's the end of my presentation, so I'm gonna let you guys get out here earlier. Uh, do, does anyone have any questions? Any questions at all? All right, well, awesome. Thank you all so much, I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate y'all not making me uh, present to an empty room on a Sunday afternoon at Southeast Linux Fest. I said I would be happy with two people. Right, and, and I got six. I, 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 like, I want to go out and do the hallway and do cartwheels, seriously. That's how happy I am right now. So thank you. I really do appreciate it. And I, and I do hope that this may be of some help to someone out there.